quick innovation quiz. Everybody got one of these this morning? Everybody got a little uh, schedule that went in the back of this? Now, without looking, how many people put it in this way? And how many people put it in this way? So you can read it? So if you put it in upside down, roll it over and read it? Which way do you skin the banana? OK. Tomorrow, some, one of the speakers will get up here and check on that. If you figure out we can make some revenue on this way, then we'll get going. What I'm going to talk about today, though, actually is something completely different. I'm going to talk about innovating inside one of the world's 30 biggest companies. So I'm from Hewlett Packard. Um, hopefully, when, when you hear that, you think of these. Um, more than likely, you thought about uh, the printer behind that. What I'm going to talk about today is actually the, the legacy, the garage. And what I'm going to talk about is something we started, um, I started as a project. We call it G job or garage job. And so inside Hewlett Packard, and and sort of, you know, part of the, the legacy to our founders, um, when, you, when you're working on a technology that you're not supposed to be doing, kind of, kind of under the radar and trying to see where you can innovate, that's what we call that. So, but I got to give you a little physics lecture to get going to get us on the same page here. So back inside this thing, what makes that work is this guy here on the right. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with those. Um, at the bottom of that, what makes that work is the world's most sophisticated squirt gun. It's a piece of silicon. It's built in a technology called MEMS, Microelectromechanical Systems. It has the ability to eject 20 picoliter drop size and up to eight colors from 2,000 nozzles per square inch, yada, yada, yada. It's a really fascinating technology. It's basically a technology that allows us to build things out of silicon that's not just an integrated electronic circuit, but actually moving parts. In this case, a squirt gun. But the other place you've got one of these um, that you may not know about is in your car. What I got hired to do at HP was actually to figure out a way to use MEMS to build a data storage device. And so the goal was to take a CD rewritable drive, shrink all of those components down, and do it on a single chip. Because what actually we were able to do was to get mechanical precision for positioning, our ability to move data bits around underneath the read-write head, the laser in the CD, more precisely than you could shrink things lithographically, as we're doing with DRAM or flash memory, and smaller than the bits you can store in a thermally stable state in a hard disk drive. And so we had this idea in 2003 that we were going to build this two gigabyte module on this device. And remember, 2003, two gigabytes was huge. Meet me in the hall, and I'll tell you what happened to that project. But the technology was going along so well, I said, what else can we do with this? And I said, hey, I think sensors are going to be the next big thing. And like I said, in your car is a MEMS device. And these started in the, the early 90s. And what happened was they needed a cheaper way to be able to tell that you'd had a collision and deploy your airbag in the car. And so it started at the very high-end cars. It was literally a gold post with a little ball on top. And if the ball fell off, it made a contact. It was about $2,000. Mercedes, BMW is where it started. And it's now trickled down to every car we sell on the planet has this airbag system. And it's really a very simple principle. Inside the car, there's a little chip. It's a little piece on my silicon MEMS chip, and it's suspended on a spring. And just as when you stop the car quickly, you go towards the dashboard. If you stop that chip quickly, that little floating piece inside moves. We detect the motion, and then we can figure out what the car is doing or not doing. And so if it moves just a little bit, you bump the garbage cans in the morning. And if it moves a lot, OK, let's, let's try to deploy the safety system. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, hopefully, there we go. So this is real-time vibrations coming out um, off my accelerometer here. So I brought one of my sensors here today. It's inside this box. This is the sixth generation, so I put a door on it. So OK, you can actually see the chip. Everybody's like, what's inside? So it's actually the little shiny square in the middle there. I've got this big gold outline. It's, for those of you who are packaging experts, it's old fashioned. But it, it works great for the, the demo here. Put a gold circle on things. People know where to look. Um, what's really amazing about this device is it measures vibration. It measures motion. And so as you can see, as I'm waving this thing around up here, um, x, y, and z in the middle of the plot here are the three axes, x, y, and z of motion that I'm measuring. I've got them combined in the upper left up there. So you can see it's, it's scaled in g's. 1g is, is right here, 9.8 meters per second squared. I drop this. It accelerates towards the ground. And so if I set it on the table, the green line is up there at 1g, because I've got z pointing down. Tip it up this way. The green goes down to 0. White goes up to 1g. Gravity is working today. OK. So always a good thing to check. The great thing about working in this field is I can calibrate my sensor wherever I go, because there's always gravity. Um, so that's, that's cool. Now, what you'll notice is that these vibrations go on the bottom. The Y chart there in the middle is actually, I've got blown up as the big A chart at the bottom to kind of scale things out so we can see a little bit better there. And what you'll see is that as I'm talking, moving around here, tap my foot a little bit, I can see that, tap the box directly, we get a huge signal out of there. But what it's actually doing is it's picking up the noise, the sound of my vibrations that this is moving. So they give me a nice table with a cloth on here today. 
I actually put on the comfy leather chair where the sensor really enjoys. Ah, oh, the comfy chair. I fell asleep. Yeah, very good. You can see. <laughs> it's kind of cool thing. So what, what it's actually done is the noise signature has changed dramatically because the chair is actually damping the vibrations. So physics, there'll be a quiz later here. It's so hard to show you what the sensitivity of this device is, but this is kind of the best thing that I've been able to come up with. So if I take this box and I'm going to hold it actually directly onto my chest, and now what you'll see is, is a lot of fuzzy white stuff at the bottom there. I'm talking very excitedly, very quickly, sound bouncing around in my chest cavity. And you'll notice there's a little bit of up and down there as I'm breathing. I'm changing the tilt a little bit. And if I wasn't so scared that this thing would work, the spikes would be a little further apart. But my heart is pounding up here right now. <laughs> and so yes, that's my heart beating right there. And in fact, I've shown this to cardiologists before. And, they, and I've had them look at it and go, P wave, S wave, R wave. Wow, you're in pretty good shape. Well, OK, I'm doing all right. But um, you know, it's, it's really that. And in fact, one step further of this technology, he said, wow, you could, I could see your breathing patterns. Like I said, the low frequency, the high frequency, the heartbeat, the phasing between when your heart is beating and actually when you're breathing in and out is a way to diagnose six heart conditions that are very difficult to diagnose otherwise. And right now, what you do is you have to put 10 electrode EKG on, and you have to put a thing around your waist and strap it on there. And that's the only way that, that they can do that. And you have to wear it for 48 hours. So the first 24 hours, you're like, what? Is this, and just like me, your heart and the rhythms and everything is kind of out of control. I mean, weird. Sorry. Um, I, you know who I am. I know who I am. All right. <laughs> let's go one step forward. We started with the car. Now, the revolution, what happens is when you start shipping 55 million cars a year, each one with an accelerometer in it, you go into new markets because we've commoditized. And so now we've got gaming devices. Now we've got smartphones where we're doing the user interface. So how many people have used the, used the Wii, played the Wii, tennis on the Wii? What you find out very quickly when you play tennis on the Wii is that if you are a tennis player, if you're not a tennis player, it's cool. You're like, hey, I'm playing tennis. If you are a tennis player, it's about the third hit when you're like, there's no top spin. There's no backhand. In fact, it doesn't care which way. In fact, it works just fine because it's an automotive-grade sensor. It's fundamentally designed to say, did you hit someone on the freeway? But we got the price point down to where it goes into consumer electronics. Okay? So yeah, go home with your kids tonight and show them how to play tennis on the Wii. Um, we, in fact, put each one of these and every one of these that we sell, just in case you drop it while it's on, we try to park the hard drive head and save the data inside. This is a 1,000 times more sensitive than the device that came out of the car. And that opens up on a whole new market, I thought. I work for a computer company. And I said, we're a computer company. We're not a gaming company. And I said, well, let me think what else I could do. So let's take this chip. And the power of the chip is not one chip. It's actually integrating the chip with something else. And so, all right, what else do we do with a lot of silicon chips that are made in MEMS? Uh -huh. We sell an awful lot of these guys. And so actually, if I could turn it into one of these guys, which is basically a wireless sensor node. So I'm going to take it, I'm going to take basically a smartphone, strip off the display, strip off the interface, plug one of my sensor chips in there, and now I have the ability to put these anywhere on the planet and start collecting this information. And hopefully, as I started showing you here, I was measuring my heartbeat. It's about getting to measure the heartbeat of the planet, collecting data, turning that data th on, through a network into the cloud where we can do an analysis on it and create actionable information. This is actually the goal of this. And what you can really start to think about is let's actually give the planet a voice. Let's give the polar bear a cell phone so you call it, dude, it's getting warm. <laughs> OK, we've got this rainforest where right now we see deforestation six months after it happens because that's when we send the satellite over the top and we get this image and see where the poachers have been and it's too late to do something about it. Let's put a node on the tree measuring the vibrations, looking at what's going on in that rainforest so that while they're out there, we can go stop this destruction that's affecting the planet. Let's have the bridge call us up, and, and I probably should have just picked the Golden Gate Bridge as I had in my old version of the slide, but in 2007 in Minneapolis, a very real tragedy happened. A freeway bridge collapsed at rush hour. And the sensor you need to do that, this vibration sensor can look at the changing of those vibrations over time, see that structure aging, and then allow us to do maintenance before the tragedy occurs. And that's going to be the power of sensor networks. A bridge like that may take 100 to 1,000 sensors to wire up that bridge. They built a new bridge. You can look at the construction engineer's reports. He had to put string gauges on rebar, old school. He actually designed the bridge. He said, someday someone's going to come along and put a new network on there. It's ready for it. It's a pretty interesting report to read. So we call it central nervous system for the Earth. And the reason for that is what we've created is this internet, this cloud, this brain, this ability to access information, to access compute power, to move information around. But it's largely blind, deaf, and numb. It doesn't feel 
what's going on at the edge of its surroundings. Sensing is the ability to take that feel, see what we're doing to the planet. The, the challenge of climate change is not the fact that, that what we're doing or not, we don't have enough data on that. It's just like this room. There is one thermostat in this room, and I noticed in cameraman number two back here, he's the guy who's comfortable. So the rest of you who are cold or warm, complain to this guy because he's by the thermostat. What we really need to do is to get to a place where we're using those sensors better to understand the house. So let's take a look at the home. So we took this over to my buddy's Matt's house. Matt's on my team. We actually mounted it right there. You can see a sensor with a little arrow mounted on the water pipe in the middle of his house. And what we were able to do from that central location with one very sensitive vibration accelerometer on there is start recording data. And there's about eight hours of data here of Matt just, you know, and on the left side, it's, it's zero to nine, and, and zero isn't midnight because we're engineers. It's when we started the experiment. And that little compression stuff in there is the vibrations of Matt's house while people are getting ready for bed. Okay? And just like we have these nerve endings where you have to teach a kid, this is hot, this is cold, we're now teaching these sensors this is somebody closing the refrigerator. This is somebody walking across the floor. This is the dishwasher running. This is the DVR left on. And the one in the middle turned out to be, this is the dog going out at 2.30 in the morning to chase the raccoons in the backyard. <laughs> and Matt getting up and going to the bathroom because, well, I'm up anyway. We go a step further because what it's about is the smart meter is telling you how the power is going to your house on a global sense. And I can tell you now down to the five minute or the 10 minute once the, anyways, soapbox, we'll stay away from that one but you're gonna get this resolution of your total power usage fluctuating by the minute, which helps them understand the demand side, the grid side, but how do you make a better decision what's going on in your house? And so what sensing is about, is about your house getting smarter about what you're doing in it, being aware of your activities in the house. And so from an energy standpoint, if my house is smart enough right now where, where I am, you know, the lights are on upstairs, how do I know they're upstairs? The sensor for that is I hear the kids downstairs, I know they left the lights on, okay? And the actuation to go do something about it is I have to go upstairs and flip the switch off. My house should be smart enough to say, nobody's upstairs, I'm going to turn the lights off for you. That's low-hanging fruit. You replace an incandescent with CFL, you say 40%. You turn the bulb off, it's 100%. <laughs> it's that simple. Turn the bulb off for me. Now, we all have been in that conference room where the lights go off, and we all do this. <laughs> and, um, sorry about the technology. Someday these will be wireless. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe it's good for us, but the reality is we need the sensors, the systems to be smarter. What's going on? If I stay on this slide much longer, my screensaver is going to go on. Microsoft hasn't figured out that when you're in PowerPoint and presenting, disable the screensaver. That's awareness. What are people doing? What's going on? Okay, let's go to my office here. Let's take this thing. Let's take this cubicle farm. I'm going to put this sensor out there. I got to get smaller than this if I really want to put a trillion of these on the planet. So I'm shooting not quite for smart dust, but something close to that, kind of TITAC size. Okay, I put it in the cubicle, and now I'm measuring the temperature in everybody's cubicle, not just one spot. We know how to do this from understanding cooling in data centers, okay? But beyond measuring just the temperature, if I put the vibration sensor in there with it, integration, just like your cell phone is now... It started as a phone, it was a backpack and a thing, and then we got down to flip phone, and now we're back up to GPS, internet device, uh, camera, video player, right? Integration. The Moore's law for sensing takes over. We measure more things. So not just the temperature, which we needed to control the HVAC and the energy there, but we understand what's going on in this, this cubicle farm. Now, by the vibration, we ignore the cubicles where nobody's in there today. And what we find out, though, if I put a little bit more sensing on there, I put, build a little weather station in there, I measure how much light is falling out, those people over there by the windows in the back, they open up the shades. And the guy who right-sized the building didn't assume that the people would like the view. And so the answer is the air conditioner can't keep up on the hottest day with the sun pouring in. And what your knee-jerk reaction from just a thermostat would be a bigger air conditioner. And that's a lot of money on recycling, and that's a big impact. The reality from the light sensor is, let's go buy some window film down to the auto parts store, and we can actually save money. Modality of sensing... A sophisticated sensing, integrated sensing is going to get us at not the problem we thought we needed to measure, but understanding what's going on out there. That's the power of sensing. And so the street light. The street light is really cool. I haven't got time to get into the Wikipedia article of why we have street lights. But it turns out 14% of all electricity used in the U.S., and it depends on how you account for it. I'm going with 14 today. And this is a picture of... And, we're all going to be flying, most of us, away from here. When you look down on your flight at night and see the streetlights on there, why do we still use streetlights? Okay, what's going on there? Can I make the streetlights turn on and off? And then what happens if I do that? From a privacy standpoint, you can't take that walk in the middle of the night anymore because, hey, the lights are going on out there. Somebody's walking down the street, right? But is it a security thing? Can we get rid of it? Is it obsolete? Is this a decision? How is this going to affect the sensing? I, I can do it now, but where does it make sense? 
mobile sensing. We're all sitting in a room right now. We were just talking about being warm or being cold here, right? Everybody in your pocket has a mobile device. I'm positive. And inside there is a temperature sensor. What its job is to do is to turn off the device if it overheats. OK, iPad, you've seen the message. OK. What it could also do, though, is wirelessly tell the building that these people are hot and these people are cold. And so let's adjust what's going on here. And in fact, from a privacy standpoint, I don't care who's sitting over here. I just need to know where they are so we can adjust that. Movie theater, same way. Cars breaking on the freeway. Three cars in front of me. I don't care whose car it is. We have to design privacy into this system. So when the car senses it's breaking, it sends my car a message because I'm texting. And I need to know that I should <laughs> slow down. OK? And so the end, the opportunity of this, the next then if you hang with me for two more slides, where this is really going, sensing is something we have to do from a standpoint of safety, sustainability, and security. How are we affecting the polar bears? What is going on in that smart freeway? What is the structures that we're building? How is the water being used in the field? Was it clean before we put the water on the spinach and figured out three months later everybody's getting sick? 50 million pounds of spinach recalled last summer. Anyways, um, the problem OK, is, is we can do that, is this information is going to be the next layer in the internet. And it's going to be available to anybody to try to analyze and figure out and make sense of it. The next Google is going to be a group of people who can develop the analytics to make sense of this. And so in the Bay Area, we have microclimates. Where I live down south of San Francisco, about 40 miles, it can be 100 degrees, it can be 55 in the city. OK? And I can't convince a tourist who visits me that we got to do, we're going to the city for dinner, we got to take a jacket. And all of us locals have to go up to the city on a summer day and see all those people. And the t-shirt or sweatshirt vendor guys love it, because they're like, I had to buy an umbrella in New York two days ago. And those guys, same thing. We have t-shirt vendor, uh, sweatshirt vendor, umbrella guys. But the, the problem is, is the weather. So what's going to happen, the next Google is going to be a group of high school students doing a science fair project, taking this grid of mini weather stations I put out there to build the smart freeway infrastructure to measure where the cars are. They happen to have these weather stations on board through sensor integration. They're going to come up with a better model for the weather, and I'm going to use their site, and that's going to pay for their ads. And the reason they can do it is because the cloud enables the compute power. They don't have to buy some massive server farm to do the analytics. They're going to get the time actually donated because they're high school students. And that's where it's going to start. And so this next layer is not about building me a map which says, I'm down there at A, I need to get to the airport at B. Do I take the road on the top or the bottom? In fact, they're not even doing this to me. And for where I live in Palo Alto to get to SFO, it's actually a binary decision, 280 or 101. OK, that's one bit. OK, Google gives me 200 kilobits here, and then JPEG that's sometimes flashing. I have to still make a decision. If I see a little bit of yellow out there on 101, I'm a local. I know you take 280. If you're not a local, good luck. OK. <laughs> but let's go further. Sensing is going to be the next thing. Let's integrate that with the weather pattern. Let's actually integrate that with, with where the traffic flow is going on right now, where the construction is, the other information we're going to pull together. Let's integrate with my Outlook calendar. I've actually got 15 extra minutes to get to the airport today, and I forgot to get my son a birthday present but that comic book shop in Redwood City on the way, which we're integrating, we're pulling in through these other databases, we're consolidating this stuff together. And what the cloud is going to do, this next layer of people are going to pull and synthesize and do the analytics and tell me, actually, here's your trip. And it's going to go directly into my car, and it's going to say, you're ending up in, in, in New York. You better take your jacket, because it's going to be raining. I'm getting married on Saturday, so if you guys could get this going by the end of the week, i got a lot of stuff to deal with on Friday. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>